Good morning, Tab. Good morning, Melissa. Good morning, Kelly, and everybody that's jumping into the call. Uh, I am so excited to have you guys here. I'm Luann Dixon, the owner of Every Stem Florist Software. Most of you know me. And um, I love doing these calls once a month with our Every Stem community because I think it's a great opportunity to connect to learn about what is on your mind, to bring some hot topics to the table, and to introduce florists who have been members of Every Stem for some time that have really interesting takes on what they're doing in the industry and who are kind of branching out into doing new things like coaching and helping other florists. And so today I want to introduce you to Tab Terpstra. She is the owner of Atlanta Flower Company in Atlanta, Georgia. And she is a 100% foam-free florist, which, you know, for some of you um, who are newer to floristry or are not really familiar with kind of some of the different types of mechanics that we use, and mechanics are the things that we kind of use to build the floral arrangement, like the vase or the container or the poles or the chicken wire, or sometimes we use this stuff called floral foam or other alternatives to it. Um, Tab has decided to run her business in a very eco-friendly way and in a way that makes her feel good about what she's doing. So I think that's really important to kind of understand that there's no good or bad here. We're not trying to make anyone feel like you shouldn't use flower foam or guilt anyone or shame anyone. We're just exploring these options because as we all have learned over the years, there are some really bad features and, and, and um, ingredients in floral foam uh, that can be harmful to us um, and to our environment. So we want to be aware of these things. And if you are currently using floral foam in your business, um, just to open up your mind about different options, things we can do to kind of mitigate any health risks that we put ourselves in, um, and then to kind of open up ideas about cool mechanics and different ways we can do things that give us more opportunity. So there's a lot of good things about this. So Tab, I want to welcome you. Thank you for being here. And um, tell me a little bit about your business and why you are a 100% foam-free florist. Sure. Thanks for the introduction. It is always so wonderful to hear someone else talk about me. I'm usually the one yapping on about myself. So <laughs> thank you for the amazing introduction. Um, yeah, so I started Atlanta Flower Company with no experience in floristry, except for the little bit of practice I did before I finally pulled the trigger and got the LLC uh, all put together. Um, I started this business just because I was, you know, planning to become a mom. I wanted to start a family. And I um, I have a wife who works a nine to five and I knew I wanted to stay home with my daughter. And so I thought, hey, what can I do where I can primarily be working on weekends? Um, and so I was like, well, I was in the service industry a long time. Um, I owned a housekeeping business for about 10 years. So I'm very used to working with folks, uh, you know, one-on-one. -on -one talking about what your needs are, talking about all the little tiny details that people are so specific about. So I was like, well, you know, I've always loved gifting people flowers. Um, I've always been so fascinated with like large flower, flower installations. And so I was like, well, I wonder if I could learn. I wonder if this is something I could kind of teach myself. So I did a big crash course. This is when the world was still very small. We were all kind of still locked inside of our houses. Um, and I live about five minutes away from a floral wholesaler. So I was like, let me go in there once a week and kind of get familiar with all these crazy things that are on the shelves in there, these flowers I've never seen in my life. And, you know, so there was a big learning curve, especially in that first like little bit of practicing, kind of teaching myself. But all the tutorials I found were, you know, in the beginning, like all the stuff that was geared towards beginners was all floral foam all the time. And I, I don't know, I just, I couldn't reason with myself being like the kind of girl that's using reusable straws at home to try and be more eco-friendly and like using cloth napkins instead of paper towels and things in my own house. And then saying, oh, okay, well, 
But when I'm at work, I'm just going to, you know, use this big hunk of plastic, put a bunch of flowers in it, and it's going to be beautiful. And then I'm just going to throw that right in the landfill and just never think about it ever again. I just, I couldn't hold the two at the same time. And so I started doing a little research, um, you know, finding folks, other folks on Instagram, a lot of folks um, like Australian florists and stuff that I follow were doing these big installations using chicken wire. Um, and my dad is actually my neighbor and a handyman. So <laughs> I oh, had cool. access to tons of zip, zip ties, table saws, wire of all kinds, power tools. So I was able to kind of play around with that a little bit, um, you know, and kind of start like making uh, armatures out of chicken wire and going to the wholesale florist and kind of looking through their inventory of like, okay, this tool, what could I use it for that I could use on site as a mechanic, right? So, um, you know, I do still use some Oasis products, but not the foam. But for instance, the floral cages, I love. I love using them. I reuse them over and over again as long as I'm able to. Um, the dishes, like the Lomi dishes and things like that, I love using those. Uh, I've since switched over to a compostable option, but in the beginning I did use just the um, Oasis Lomi bowls uh, right from the wholesale florist. Um, yeah, and I was, uh, you know, kind of exploring a little bit. I, I'm a gardener too. So very into working in the garden. Um, and my dad, who, like I said, is like a handyman, jack of all trades kind of guy. He was teaching himself how to grow mushrooms and how to grow tomatoes hydroponically. And he had this weird substance uh that i was like oh my god that'd be a perfect one-to-one -one replacement of foam this like eco-friendly replacement to foam and i've got a little right here i use it all the time this is oh, my one-to-one cool. -one replacement nice. um it's called rock wool and essentially it's it's texturally very similar to uh floral foam it comes in a variety of shapes and sizes um and for later on in the recap of this video uh, I've got a link to my storefront where I've got links to all kinds of stuff like this. So you'll be able to find it later. Oh, that's um, great. But essentially it's made out of pumice stone. <clears throat> yeah. Here, let me write that rock wool. Someone's asking, can I see the product? Yeah. Name Kelly's rock asking, can I wool. see the name of the product? Yes. Rock wool. And so that's similar to agro wool, right, Tab? Is that correct? Is it a similar product? Yes. I think um, for legal reasons, we'll say it's very incredibly similar. And okay. that's all we'll cool. say. Uh, gotcha. You know, I would say it's it's similar in almost every single way, uh, okay. except for the name. Gotcha. So, gotcha. <laughs> um, but I've done some... there, but yeah. Yes. Uh, they, I think the only, you know, main difference is they uh, have a handle on higher up manufacturing. So they're able to get some different shapes and different sizes than the ones that are more readily available. Um, Got it. It's almost exclusively sold for like hydroponic growing veggies, growing plants without soil. Um, yeah, which just makes it this like perfect substrate because it's not dissolving in water. But I've used it for gardening as well. And you can start your seeds in here and then just put it right in the soil. So it does break down in the soil and it's essentially just made like cotton candy. So instead of sugar uh, being spun really, really hot and quickly to like whip up into cotton candy, it's dust from pumice stones, like volcanic rock that's being superheated spun at a very high speed and turns into these wispy fibers. And then they use some mix of like plant matter and uh, sucrose, some kind of sugar as a binder to press it all together into these little blocks. And I use this just as a one-to-one -one replacement to foam. And then whenever I'm all done at the end of the day, 
I can just toss that whole thing in the compost and it's going to, it's going to break down right here in my home compost. So, you know, occasionally I'll be able to kind of like reuse the, um, <clears throat> the rock wool for something else in the garden afterwards. But most of the time it just ends up in the compost to save some time. That's so great. So I know that understanding different opportunities with your, um, mechanics is so good because sometimes we look at floral foam and we say, okay, that's the only option. You know, it's right. just the most readily available thing for us as florists to use. And frankly, you know, I started as a florist in like 2005, 2006, and it was just kind of like the thing that was kind of pushed at you in, in any that's floral enough. design class or anything like that. So I know with the rock wool, there's a product called the Ocean Pouch that I've done a blog mm -hmm. about. If anybody has questions about that, I'd be happy to talk about it. These products are really good for like installations, things Definitely. where, you know, you need a water source, but you can't, you know, hang it on the ceiling. Right? We can't have mm -hmm. use a bucket in the chandelier or something like that. Um, and it's important to note, I would ask Tab too, what your opinion is. I feel like those are really good for like, making things like the morning of, or maybe the day before, if you have a cooler, but those Definitely. aren't really things that we want to use for designs that are going to need to last like four or five days. What's your experience with that? And how do you decide when you're going to kind of use something like rock wool versus just a bucket with water or a moss soaked, you know, chicken wire burrito or something like that? Right. So that was another very difficult learning curve because there were definitely some days where I said, okay, I'm going to, you know, cut things down, bring them on site, and I'm going to get them all placed and have all the time in the world, have plenty of time, don't need to worry about this at all. And then just been scrambling right there at the end, like, oh my gosh, I should have done this in advance. I should have done this way in advance. Um, I will say, honestly, with the rock wall, um, I've been able to design three or four days in advance and it doesn't break down. It works just fine. Um, and it does take quite a bit of time to break down in the compost. So I think that's the trade-off, but I've been able to design several days in advance. Um, but there are definitely some flowers that are, you know, going to be more sensitive. Definitely, you know, you're working with ranunculus, scabiosa, anything that's like maybe going to bruise, maybe going to bend. Those are all going to be something that you want to do day of on site. Um, and so I, I work on that a couple of different ways. A lot of times I will um, prepare a bunch of water picks um, and just have a whole bucket of filled water picks that are already ready to go. And I'll cut down my stems and just put them in a vase off to the side at the about the height that I'll need them to be for an installation. That way, when I show up on site, it's just as easy as picking up the water pick that already has water, grabbing my stem that's already pretty close to the right height. You know, it always needs a little adjusting on site. Putting it in that water tube and just pushing it into usually a chicken wire armature or sometimes... Um, I'll use like an Oasis cage with this inside if I'm doing something that's really, really lush um, where I have a, a nice attachment point where I want something really full. Um, yeah, that's one way that I go about it. Another way that I go about it is um, I had a custom arch, a steel arch made by a welder here in Atlanta. Um, and I had him make it so that all angles of it kind of have this how should I say it? Like a kind of a ladder effect. Like it's got rungs that go up the sides. Oh, cool. And yeah. So with that, I'm able to, you know, put my chicken wire on, attach it however I like, but I'm also able to like zip tie on a cup or a vase and just fill that with water, put my flowers inside, cover up any mechanics with greenery or other flowers with water picks, anything on the outside. And that is really just the best for whenever you are working somewhere that's hot, working with flowers that are super thirsty, because I'm sure we've all experienced using water picks, especially if you try to do something with hydrangea in a water pick. 
that water is gone. In two seconds, that water is gone. Your flowers are wilting. It was all for naught. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Stuff. It's just not enough water in those little, I've actually done a few different things in the past. I've used like um, plastic bags that I reuse mm -hmm. over and over again. I've like double bagged and had more water kind of tied it off and stuck it into an arch um, and definitely like jars and, you know, kind of little buckets that you can kind of attach to the arch is a great thing too, because some flowers, I mean, even in floral foam here in Texas, and I know we'll talk about this, but you know, the, the heat can be a factor, whether it's in foam or not. Sometimes flowers oh, yeah. it's in the sun. So that's really more about a timing and kind of planning ahead. Like you said, oh, you yeah. know, prepare as much as you can ahead of time, build it in sections, then go out in the sun and kind of assemble and put your finer flowers, your little flourish flowers in that are going to be more delicate at the end. Um, Definitely. Yeah. I think that's a huge thing. So tell me a little bit about I know your website is amazing. I love your website. I was just on it the other day, but I've been on it before. Just gave it a facelift this past week. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. And I think one of the reasons it's so good is because your personality comes through. Who you are, what you're about, oh, what you care about, why you love doing flowers. And I think sometimes that's hard to do in a unique way where it doesn't feel like you're trying to force something um, so if anybody's interested, right. is it atlantaflowercompany.com? I've got every iteration. So I've got ATL Flower Co. That's the one that's kind of attached to my email and everything official. But Atlanta Flower Company will take you there. ATL Flower Co. will take you there. I've got all of them. <laughs> okay, cool. That's great. Yeah, that's another thing. It's nice to have a couple things that redirect to your site. Um, Definitely. So when you decided to go foam free, you knew that it was something you wanted to make important to you. But then you realized that you could actually use this as a selling point for your customers. And I think oh, this absolutely. is really important for our members to understand because it's not something it's something that happens behind the scenes. Yes, it's a choice we make as business owners to choose what mechanics we use and why we use them. But how have you turned this into a selling point for your customers? And how can you kind of advise other designers who are maybe interested in doing that, how you went about that and how you would recommend they do something like that? Sure. So I will say, you know, there's a lot of talk in the wedding industry overall, especially in floristry, um, just kind of saying like, oh, well, it's an oversaturated market. There are so many options. How could anyone ever choose? And maybe it's true. Maybe it's not true. Uh, there are definitely a ton of amazing florists everywhere you look. I mean, you go online, you're going to find a million of them and they're all doing something amazing. Um, but especially here in Atlanta, um, I kind of looked around to see what other full service florists and stuff were doing out here. And I really, a few and far between, I would find folks who were doing foam free or had the option to kind of do an upcharge and go foam free. But I didn't really see anyone who was basing their entire business off of it, at least not to the market that I work with, which is more of a like fun loving kind of edgy, a little bit kind of kooky, colorful out there sort of crowd, which is going to fall in line with someone who wants something sustainable. You know, we're working with millennials or starting to work with Gen Z. We're working with a crowd of people that values this as part of their life. And I mean, I'm also a millennial, so I'm in that group and I value that as part of, as part of my life. Um, so having that to sort of be a talking point um, or just something that sets me apart felt really natural to do. It was easy to incorporate because like I said, I taught myself floristry with that in mind of, you know, being foam free as part of my learning process. So I didn't have a lot of unlearning to do in order to make it happen for myself and make it happen for my business. Um, which, you know, there's pros and cons either way of knowing how to do it multiple different ways. Uh, but it has been great having a 
my whole portfolio, everything in my portfolio, I can say, if you love this and you want to work with me, all of this is foam free. I can do all of this foam free for you. That's the only real option you have. Um, and I don't have to talk about it in the sense of, well, if you pay me more than what's listed, I can do it foam free for you if you want, which is kind of what I saw you know, it's, it's an upsell, it's an upcharge in a lot of businesses. And that can definitely put pressure on people, this kind of conflicting kind of, I don't know, just a friction on your potential clients of saying, oh, well, uh, you know, it sure would be good if I could be foam free, but for the extra charge, I don't know, is it worth it? And for me, it's all just built in. And I think that's been really great for my business, just being able to say, hey, these are the prices. Yes, they are a little bit more, but yes, we're also foam free all the time. So it's not foam free if you can afford it. It's not foam free if you feel like paying extra. It's just, this is what we do. This is what I'm practiced on. I can do this for you. And I think even, even for folks who are starting to transition slowly, or maybe want to toy around with it a little bit and have something to show their potential clients, I would say, you know, start with some foam-free centerpieces. Um, you know, even a bud vase is foam-free. So if you want to show some foam-free work, even a bouquet is foam-free, right? So you can start with something small. You can start with, okay, I'm going to do this wedding. I'm going to do all foam-free centerpieces. And then there you go. That's your, for your portfolio, you can say, hey, if you like these centerpieces, they're completely foam free. It doesn't have to be all at once. It doesn't have to be, I'm going to close down my business for a few weeks while I learn foam free, and then I'll come back and I'll be this completely new business, completely new selling point. You can start sort of dripping it in a little bit or saying, you know, if you want to have a completely foam free wedding, you know, I'll do it at this price or this price so I can get my portfolio built up the same as we all did whenever we first started our business. Um, but I will say a lot of people have found me just because I put that I'm foam free everywhere. So whenever people are looking up on Google, sustainable Atlanta florists, sustainable Atlanta flowers, eco-friendly, foam free Atlanta flowers, I'm popping up pretty close to the top, even without a massive ad budget. I'm, I'm showing up at the top because I show off my portfolio in there. I say, hey, this is foam free. This is, you know, an eco-friendly option, the sustainable option. And we see people, you know, people getting married. Our couples will, you know, sometimes they'll be opting for bamboo plates or bamboo silverware, or they'll be looking for, you know, other sustainable vendors too. And if I'm one of the many sustainable vendors they're choosing from, that's been a great experience too, because I get to work with a lot of the same vendors over and over and get a nice team together. Yeah, there's so many different advantages to kind of having that throughout your website, because I know a couple of months ago, we talked to our friend Mickey, who is an SEO expert. If you guys have questions mm -hmm. about SEO, he's great. Um, his business is Mansky House, and you can look back at our YouTube channel and see our video with Mickey. Um, he's helped me with my website and, you know, putting in things that are organically important to your business onto your copy on your website is what Tab's talking about here. She's basically putting things like I'm foam free. This design was foam free. This is an eco-friendly arrangement. This is an eco-friendly installation. This was done with no foam. And just by mentioning that, because it's something that's part of her business and who she is and what she's doing, it's actually increasing her client intake because people are looking for those things. So it's got a really nice natural organic situation that you're doing, Tab, without necessarily having to pay for a lot of ads um, because yes. it's, it's working for you in a positive way. So I think that's really cool to think about it if you have something in your business, whether it's, you know, being foam free, being sustainable, being whatever it is you are that you believe in, 
take that and think about how you can make that part of your website, part of what you're selling. There are going to be people out there that probably gravitate to that. So that's just in general, a really great lesson for everybody to understand, like putting in that personality about who you are. We're not just a florist. We're a florist who serves the Atlanta market with eco-friendly, foam-free designs for people who love color and want a bold wedding. And we love everyone and we're inclusive. That is about what you are, you know? And so it takes it to this whole another level, which I think is super cool. Um, So if anybody has questions about that selling point, um, pop them in the chat or unmute and you're welcome to ask. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Tab's designs and I want to share my screen and just show you a recent wedding that she did that she is generous enough to share the recipes with us. So in our next um, group email, we're going to get the recipes for this wedding um, that are all foam free, obviously. And um, we'll be sharing a little bit more about that um, when we uh, go through and, and kind of do the replay and everything. But I just want to show you the images here. And I want to just talk about, let's see if I can share this, if everybody can see my screen. Can everybody see that? Give me like a little thumbs up. Kelly's saying yes. Okay, great. Um, so this is a gorgeous wedding that Tab did. And I'm going to let her talk a little bit about, you know, how she did these designs foam free. But I do have this software called EveryStem and Tab is a member. She's been using EveryStem for quite a while now. And one of the things that she wanted to talk about when we started talking about um, doing this call was that she wanted to really make a point about smart utilization of your flower order as part of being an eco-friendly florist, going foam free, understanding how that all kind of ties together. So Tab, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about this wedding, the recipes, you know, how you did the mechanics for these arrangements, and then kind of dive into, you know, how you use every stem and how that helps you with this process and why utilizing your entire flower order is also an important part of your business model. Sure. So the most important thing for a business, right, is that you are making a profit because otherwise you're doing something, but it's not running a business, but you are doing something. Uh, we call it spending money. Um, <laughs> we call it going shopping. Uh, so it's super important to make sure that you are using every single bloom. And for us, that means sticking with our recipes that are written. That means using up all our blooms in the way that we intended to use them and not just using all of our blooms by saying, oh, we've got this whole extra bucket of flowers. Guess we better use them and just put them all in this design and overstuff it. Um, You know, so having your recipes down, making sure that you are you know, understanding the shape that it might make. And all of this, you know, comes with experience over time. But, you know, I understand the different sized roses. I know if I order uh, like this pink one in here, I know it's going to be larger than the Hermosa rose that's in here, which will be a bit smaller. So I'm able to sort of visualize in my mind while writing those recipes up um, what that'll look like, how many I'll actually need. I also am using the same vessels at almost every wedding. We have a variety of three or four different centerpiece vessels and a couple different sizes that we use over and over again. Um, We just use all the ones from Accent Decor. Uh, The ones that we like the most from Accent Decor, there are a variety of options to choose from, but we do have a location down here in Georgia, so I'm able to just zoom over and pick them up. Yeah, so utilizing your order to the fullest, making sure that you are intentionally using all of the flowers that you bought and not just throwing flowers at designs so that you can say, oh, it feels like I used all the flowers. No, 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 that's not going to work for your bottom line. So at this wedding, we knew that she very specifically was asking for the color palette to be the album cover of a Taylor Swift record, which was a very... (laughs) Oh, I 
I love that. That's so cool. I mean, hey, if you love it, go for it, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I was like, okay, cool. You know, we've gotten a million different quote unquote crazy request but this one was you know I looked at the cover and I was like oh okay it's just a it's like a kind of a cloudy bright rainbowy pastel-y vibe I can make this happen so we knew she loved roses this was a late February wedding so you'll see some of the blue uh mascari in there and sweet peas which we grow here uh at my house the birds have spread them all over my neighborhood. So there's always. Oh, wow. sweet I didn't know you could grow those. That's so cool. I love it. <laughs> They're great. Honestly, there's too many sometimes, but you'll That's see a good in the rest problem of to have, you know, too many sweet peas. <laughs> Definitely. I know they smell so good. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah. So far as mechanics on here, uh, let's see the arch. You can see just a little bit of, that was a new product that we used for the base there. Um, all of these flower orders you're going to see in the recipes are all coming from Mayesh. So I know there's Mayesh locations all over the U.S. I don't know how many of your every stem users are using Mayesh, but a lot of the products you'll be able to find at your wholesaler um, anywhere, any wholesaler that you use. Uh, all of the flowers from this recipe are going to be from a wholesaler. So there's nothing... Nothing too specific uh, grown by local growers that you shouldn't be able to find. Um, <clears throat> but we used a new product uh, in this wedding arrangement to get this kind of like cotton candy color fluffy vibe. Um, we used some pre-made baby's breath garlands that were, um, what is it? Not dip dyed, not sprayed, but they were, you know, dyed the bucket, the bucket water Oh, from stem up. Colors. Yeah, they were like That's food right. coloring dyed almost. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And whenever we purchased them, um, they came in 10 foot or 15 foot sections, basically just like a big fluffy rope of baby's breath, which was so cool because that meant I didn't have to do it and it was more affordable. Um, and we were able to use that as part of our mechanics, which is always just check, check, check. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Buying the garlands pre-made like that is kind of the newer, fairly newer thing. Like when I first started my flower shop, they didn't really sell baby's breath garlands like that. Yeah. And now, I mean, I've heard of a couple other Every Stem members using them and saying they hold up. I mean, baby's breath, you know, you can't kill it if you wanted to. That's so right. it holds up well. It's a great base. So that's a really smart trick. Looking into what's already pre-made that you can then utilize is, is really great. Anything that takes something off your plate, always amazing. I'm a, a stay at home mom on top of running this business. So if I don't have to stay up making 40 feet of baby's breath garland, fantastic. <laughs> but you'll see in several of these photos, um, the one with the arch, the sweetheart table right in the center there, um, that we use that as our base. Uh, for the arch itself, we used it and just attached it to the um, arch that was on site with a couple of zip ties. And then we just pushed our flowers in all along the edge. A couple of them we needed water picks. Like I said, this was February and it was indoors. So with the roses, we actually didn't end up needing a water source at all. We just put them in on site. They looked amazing. No mechanics needed, nice and simple. Um, but with this sweetheart table that's right in the center here, all of that was actually designed in um, disposable metal uh, loaf pans. Like if you've ever made like a banana bread or like bought a banana bread from the farmer's market or something, that kind of like aluminum tin container that's uh, about this big and about this deep. We just used rock wool inside of those containers made our arrangements in little almost one foot sections, put them down on the table and then put that baby's breath garland right in the front to cover our mechanics. Nobody knew. It looks super lush. It looks like it's blooming right out of the table. Nobody had any idea. We covered it up in the front and then we covered up the mechanics in the back. So the couple didn't have to see that mess either. Um, 
Yes, yes. Cover the back, so, please. Right. That's a big part. Yes. Don't forget, if you use mechanics, you have to cover them. It's like your underwear showing. Nobody wants to see that. <laughs> totally. Absolutely. I know. I give myself some leeway on the back of an arch or something. No one's going back there. But if the couple that's paid me all this money is going to be at the sweetheart table, give them something nice to look at. Not just their guests, but something nice on the back, too. We always try to put a couple of little candles back there, too. So it's not just like you're on display to everybody, but you're you're in your nice little cozy moment with your partner as well. So, yeah, you can kind of see in here how we are still able to get these really lush, really big fluffy looking arrangements without using any foam at all so I know that a lot of times that's a concern for people thinking oh well if I don't have foam then my arrangements will be small or they'll be you know we do arrangements that are airy but sometimes people are worried like oh it's gonna look bald it's gonna look empty it's gonna look like it's not taking up space when I have found that to just not be true at all um, it really just comes down to thinking creatively, how can I design this in a couple of small pieces to put together on site rather than in a huge, large arrangement that I'm going to have to carry in as one piece. Um, yeah, and then the same with our uh, centerpieces as well. Those were designed in, we use... Um, they're linked in my they're linked in my Amazon shop, but they're essentially they're like to go soup bowls that are made with, I think, like maybe bamboo pulp or something. I know they're tree free and they're compostable and, you know, they do get a little bit soggy after a few days, but they don't leak water. They hold water. Um, so we'll design in those and we'll design either with a ball of chicken wire or some rock wool if we're doing a large, like a long transport. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sloshing water all over my car. <laughs> yeah, that's a big factor too, kind of making sure that it's, oh know, my gosh, container is yes. deep enough where it's not just going to spill everywhere. Or when you get there, you just have to, you know, if it's a 20 minute drive, I've done things where I've dumped most of the water out. When mm -hmm. I get there, I refill it. So, you know, we, you can always Definitely. do that. Too. Yeah. We just design in our sort of like ugly little compostable bowls. And then we just drop those right into our vessels on site. There's no need to take up extra space in your fridge or your porch or your shed or wherever it is you're designing by designing directly inside of the bowl. Um, and our clients love it too. So a lot of times we're able to, um, if our if our client decides they want the flowers to go home with them after, they want to send them home with guests, we'll still use those uh, plastic loamy bowls or we'll use one of the uh, like aluminum tin containers to design in. And then mm -hmm. the guests can just lift that right up and just take that home with them. And all we have to do is just come and pick up our vessels and take those home. Win, win, win. Yeah, that's such a great advantage. I mean, I've had over the years so many clients who have asked me to take flowers home. And sometimes I do wonder, like I did a wedding where we had giant, tall branch arrangements with like tall flowers. And that family took every single flower <laughs> home with them. And I thought these branches, they're going to poke themselves in the eye. Like it's a liability, but you know, I got to say it was the easiest cleanup we've ever oh, yeah. done. And if you can just build that into your business at this point, the, the flowers, I've always had the mentality of the flowers are the clients. They are paying us to design the flowers, but the product itself, those flowers should belong to the client at the end of the night. Absolutely. And they should have the opportunity to decide, do I want to take these home? Do I want to donate them? Do I want to, you know, whatever it is that they want to do with them. So if you can build in, you know, the already thought process of saying, I'm going to make these arrangements in a container that then I just drop into my vessel. You're winning in so many different ways. You're less likely to have the client take your container home that, you know, is the more expensive accent. To oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> and then you don't have a matching set anymore. <laughs> right. We've all chased someone down the hallway of the ballroom being like, wait, please. Oh, yeah. Take that. You know, and so that way, if it's already in a, in another liner, they're much more likely to spread that word and let their 
you know, friends and family take it home without taking your containers. And then also you're just doing something else that makes your life easier because once they're gone, all you're doing is cleaning up the vases. You're not having to compost flowers and, and deal with all that. So that's a lot of. Exactly. A it lot saves of me the day process. of work the next day. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So Tab, does any, well, let me say, these are amazing. They're beautiful. And I love that they're hundred percent foam free. I think it's so interesting to see how you did the, uh, the sweetheart table with the containers, the aluminum containers, and then just putting that garland in front. I think building out the base of an arrangement is so important. Um, right now I do a decent amount of freelancing and I see when we're building those long head tables that mm -hmm. people aren't necessarily filling in the bottom. And then when you get on site, you're like, oh gosh, now I got to go back and kind of hide every little bit of greenery here and there. <laughs> <laughs> Taking a piece of garland or a few pieces of long Italian rescus or something and just laying yeah. it in front is such a great way to kind of hide that without having to go and cut a million little pieces of greenery. So I think that's Absolutely. a good idea. Um, and I think that's another topic that, you know, another topic for another day, but kind of works in with this one as well. Working with foam free mechanics, one of the best things that I have learned along the way is what can I use that does not need a water source? So greenery, for sure, figure out which greenery does not need a water source. And you are going to save yourself so much work on site, such a big headache, uh, especially like we do a lot of foraging and stuff. So even knowing like what trees can I go cut down some limbs and they're still going to look good, or I can just put them in a bucket of water and they'll still look good. Because that way you're able to, you know, completely build out anything that needs greenery or just take it on site to use to fill in spaces without worrying like, okay, it's doing a good job covering up our mechanics right now. But if the sun comes out or if it ends up raining or if they decide to move the table a little more in the sun, what is it going to look like? You don't need to worry about it. If you know what plants and what flowers can take it and which can't, that's going to save you a lot of time and money too. So of course, Ruscus being a classic, that one's always going to tried and true. That one's going to hold up for you. Again, you couldn't kill it if you tried. <laughs> yeah. And I think having kind of that list of flowers and, you know, knowing like what you said earlier, knowing which ones you need to kind of put in at the last minute, and then knowing which ones that are going to be hardy that you can really rely on. I think that does come with experience. But I know um, if anybody has a question about that, shoot me an email. I think I have a list of like really hardy greenery and flowers that is like, you know, something that we've had for a long time that can really be helpful when you're first starting out. So shoot me an email if you need um, that kind of a list. If anybody yes, has I wish I questions, had that right in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Learning that is, is valuable. Um, and experimenting with stuff, like you said, you know, trying to think about if you're foraging and things like that, do a little test, you know, go oh, out yeah. there a couple weeks ahead of time, take it out, put it in the sun, you know, don't be afraid to try things like that, um, because that's the way you're going to learn is just by experimenting. Um, so if anybody has any questions about those recipes or how Tab's doing her foam-free designs, pop them in the chat um, and we can ask her those. I know... One thing you said about your vessels was that you're kind of constantly using the same containers. You're consistently using some of the same things. I know you guys have a really nice a la carte menu that mm -hmm. you kind of have standardized, uh, you know, offerings for your clients. Talk a little bit about how standardization and how kind of creating, you, you know, your menus using your containers and kind of really driving that. I think that really helps to kind of establish, you know, the ability for you to do the foam free mechanics and make it easier for you to kind of really, as an entire business, make sure that you're kind of sticking to those goals. How has that helped you um, in your business, you know, with, with being a foam free florist? Oh, it's just been amazing. Um, you know, we work with couples with a giant range of budgets and we don't specifically have a quote unquote minimum that you have to hit to work with us. And, you know, 
you still have to make money. Like we were saying earlier, you've got to make sure you're making money. So there are always a couple of different ways that you can come at that conversation with a potential client. And that is sort of by coming in and saying, hey, is staying at or below your budget the most important thing? Or is your vision for this, you know, larger scale um, flower moment at your wedding? Is that more important? Because that's going to determine how I advise a potential client. I'm never trying to be the one that's saying, oh yeah, we can do that. I'll, I'll just take a loss on that. But I'm also not the one that's trying to say like, oh, you can't have anything in that budget. That's impossible to work with. Um, so having our a la carte be a completely separate option from our full service has been amazing because we have some clients that, you know, it's getting more and more common to have a an all-inclusive venue. A lot of people who are, um, you know, working on a tighter budget for their wedding, they're going to go for an all-inclusive venue. It's easier. It makes sense to me. And they generally will say, hey, we'll provide the flowers and you're allowed to hire on someone to do your personal flowers if you want, but we're going to do the flowers for the venue. And so we were getting a lot of requests for that for some full service venues here around Atlanta, where they were saying, you know, the flowers at the venue are going to be fine. The arch is fine. It's, you know, just a couple of moments here and there. The centerpieces are fine. But for my portraits, for my husband, for my wife, for my bridesmaids, whatever, we really want your work. And, you know, that's, all, but that's all we need. And so that's not that's not a full service budget. That's not, oh, this is going to be my only job this weekend or my only job today. And that's going to pay my mortgage. And that's going to be enough for me to block up this whole day for them. So by having our a la carte options, it's been perfect because I can say, hey, just go through our website. You want 10 bouquets. You want five boutonnieres. You want some corsages for mom. You want a couple of uh, bud vases, centerpieces, whatever. Just go through our website. You can add those to your cart. Every one that you select, a little pop-up will come up. It'll say, you know, do you want neutrals, pastels, or something vivid? And then here's a space for you to drop your Pinterest link. Tell me about the colors. I will get as close to that as I can while making it work with the budget. Um, if you use every stem, uh, which I'm sure almost everyone in here does, I'm sure you'll know that there's the, the markup tool. So... Whenever we're working um, with our a la carte flowers, we're essentially just doing that backwards. So if they are dying to have delphinium in their arrangements, I'll say, hey, we can put some delphinium in there, but there's going to be some carnations in there too, because we're working backwards on our budget here. But if you leave it to me and you trust me to work within this budget, make something you like in a color palette you like, I'll do, you know, more just middle of the line price blooms all the way through to make it make sense within the budget rather than saying, okay, you want uh, Miss Piggy roses. You want, you know, purple larkspur. You want this, you want that. We don't run through the large list of specific flowers with one another. I just say, Hey, we're going to get your vision. We're going to get as close as we can. If it's something heinous where they're saying, Oh, I want to spend a hundred dollars on a bouquet with a, uh, 20 peonies in there. I'll send them an email and just say, hey, like some things are possible, some things aren't. We could maybe get like a couple packs of peonies for the whole the whole thing and kind of spread them around, but <laughs> you gotta be reasonable <laughs> with part, what we can do, right? Yeah, exactly. Definitely. But for the most part, it's really helped with that differentiation of what does full service look like? Full service looks like me being on site maybe doing an installation, maybe having things that need to be put together while I'm there, probably means that I'm coming and breaking down at the end of the night. Whereas with our a la carte, we're still able to do the foam free arrangements. So our a la carte is still a little more expensive than most others. Um, but you know, like I was saying earlier, like even a bud vase is foam free, a bouquet for the most part is going to be foam free. So we're able to keep those foam free promises. And then when we are doing centerpieces, um, you know, I'll tell them, Hey, if you want to use the centerpieces that are in all these photos, that'll be a rental and we can bring it back or I'll design it in whatever 
you know, whichever bowl or container, like the aluminum containers that we use sometimes, I'll design it in that. And I'll send you an Amazon link to vessels that will work with it. I'll send you the dimensions and you can pick whichever specific thing you want. Or a lot of times people will say, oh, I just want it to be something white, something easy. And we use these really deep, just white porcelain cereal bowls from Amazon. They're super affordable. They're maybe a buck 50 to two bucks a piece. And they come in packs of 12. They're great. They are amazing to design in. People never know that it's just a cereal bowl. <laughs> that's such a great, yeah, that's such a great trick. I love that. And those are in your Amazon um, storefront too, Tab? Yeah, they should be in there. Okay. Oh, okay, great. perfect. I um I will make a hundred percent sure they're in there. I'm pretty okay. sure I've got the cereal bowls in there. Link to the cereal bowls. Okay, great. So we'll make sure um, if anybody wants those links, just pop your email address at the bottom um, in the chat. And I'll make sure that we get those over to you guys. If you're not already, if you got the email from me this morning um, and you're already on our email list, you don't have to drop your email. But if you're not on my Every STEM email list, drop your email in this chat and I'll be sure that we get um, that um, information to you along with Tab's recipes and the pictures of some of the designs and everything. So um, that'd be awesome. Um, yeah. So I know one of the last things you wanted to talk about was kind of composting and how that kind of comes into play, being a foam-free florist, being a gardener. Um, we have a lot of floral designers who also are, you know, farmers. We have a lot of farmer florists that use every stem. So tell me a little bit about your process with that. And, um, and then we can do a little bit of questions at the end if anybody has questions. Yeah, sure. So let me start here by saying you don't have to invest a ton of money into getting a compost uh, situation together. But the best place I've found to get a compost tumbler is on Facebook Marketplace at the end of summer because everybody who decided to go all in and spend their tax refund and all their extra money on, oh, I'm going to be a gardener this year. Usually by the end of summer, they're on Facebook Marketplace like, I don't want to be out in this heat. I'm going to just sell all of this stuff here and someone else can come and get this thing. So <laughs> I found my huge compost tumbler on uh, Facebook marketplace. I actually found it for free. Someone was like, I'm just going to put this out on the curb. Someone come get it. It was a little stinky, but we just used a truck, put it in the back of the truck, brought it over to the house. It's not like it's coming inside to live with me. So it was all good. Um, but I think that that's absolutely the best way to go because if you do like an open air compost or I don't know if people are still messing around with building furniture out of pallets or whatever, there were all kinds of DIYs for stuff like that. If you live on a little property like I do, I live on a quarter acre. I'm in the city. If I had just like an open air compost going on in my yard, no possums, rats, squirrels, all kinds of stuff. You want something that closes if you don't have enough land to put your compost way far away from the house. Otherwise, you're attracting bugs. It's going to stink in the summer. You're attracting little vermin. You don't want any of that <laughs> right up next yeah, to the house. Yeah, we want to yeah, keep that out of there. So make sure that it's closed. Yes. Right. Eco-friendly and you know, let's still live like human beings. No animals up right up at the house. <laughs> right. Especially for us people who still live within the city parameter. Yeah. Totally. So I just, it's basically like a big barrel and it's up on a stand and it has a crank on the side. So I'm able to put in the new material, crank it around a little bit. And that tosses it with the old material. Usually I'm going out there about once a season or so just to completely empty it out. Um, since it's up on a stand, mine is up tall enough that I just push my wheelbarrow underneath, open up the door, and then crank it so that it all just dumps right into the wheelbarrow. Super simple. Um, I had a back injury in 2020. So like lifting stuff up and shoveling and tossing the compost and stuff was just not an option for me. This this method is perfect. I highly suggest getting a tumbler, one that has a crank on the side. It's so much easier, especially if you're a little squeamish about, you know, oh, it's it's essentially just rotting food and rotting flowers and I don't want to touch it. 
having that crank on the side is perfect. You don't even have to break a, break a nail or break a sweat. So we use ours for our kitchen compost. Occasionally we'll rip up some of our boxes, our cardboard boxes and put them in there too. If it needs a little bit of roughage in there. Um, but we are always putting out a tarp underneath our workspace whenever we're processing flowers. All the scraps, all the guard petals from the roses, all the leaves, all the thorns, all the everything go right into that tarp. We just pick that bad boy up, throw it over your shoulder like Santa Claus, take it out to the compost, put it all in there and just let her cook. She just does her thing all summer long. <laughs> that's so awesome. I love that. Yeah, I think that's a really smart way because you feel like a little bit, I have one friend who's South Austin and she has a garden and we kind of use the flower boxes at our feet. And then mm -hmm. she has a big pile, compost pile out in the backyard uh, where we throw all the, but for most of the other florists that I work with, you know, we're just throwing it into the trash, into the dumpster. So this is such yeah. a, a much better option, especially if you're working out of a home studio, you know, it can be really viable. Totally. I see a question in here. Can you compost stems from the wholesaler? Um, do flowers that have had floral food do okay to compost? And are there chemicals we need to think about? So as with anything working with flowers, there are always chemicals to think about. Um, I cannot say 100% for sure that I would feel comfortable using this compost for growing veggies or something that I would eat. That's a personal choice. I'm sure that it happens. And, you know, to what end? I don't know. I've never heard of anything terrible or great about it either way. Um, I am only growing flowers, so I don't have to worry too much about, you know, ingesting uh, any chemicals that might be in them from another farm. Um, but that is definitely something that if you're if you're thinking, oh, I might use these garden beds for food as well or food later on down the line, that's definitely something to think about. Um, I have asked May Esh. They made a post on their main Instagram page. This is my wholesaler, May Esh. Uh, they made a post on their main Instagram page talking about composting as a form of sustainability. And I was asking them if they compost as a wholesaler. Um, and they told me that if there is a, a citywide organized compost pickup, like the same for trash and recycling, that they do. So I would say that Mayesh, their website probably will have some more information about the details behind that, probably answering some of the questions about, you know, what is safe to do with it. Um, but I do know that they are composting their flowers as a wholesaler uh, to like a citywide um, pickup and that it has been approved for that. And, you know, wherever that compost is distributed after, I'm not 100% sure, but I know that here in Atlanta, at least, it's distributed around to small local farms. But of course, you know, they're picking up from not just flower wholesalers, they're picking up from anyone and everyone. So it's mixed in with mostly compost from other farms or restaurants, this, that, and the other. So with the chemical aspect of it, it really is just maybe a matter of comfort, a matter of what you're doing with the compost after. Um, and then, you know, just being familiar with your wholesaler too. Yeah, I think that's a lot of um, thought process behind that is kind of saying, okay, you know, if I'm willing to compost it and, you know, use it for a flower garden, then I think that's great. You know, if you're getting into growing like your own food and things like that, then you might want to be more careful about, okay, am I putting, you know, only things that, you know, I know have been grown organically into that compost. Absolutely. And then you kind of have to split it up a little bit. So that's a great question, Kelly. I think it's important to kind of think through those things, depending on what your purpose is for your garden, for sure. So, um, and all of ours are raised raised bed gardens except for <laughs> where I tore out my lawn to put in um a flower garden so that's part of it too is that you know it's it's just red clay here in Atlanta in Georgia so <laughs> like getting any organic matter at all to stick on top of that red clay is I'm thankful for it uh but growing veggies and stuff in that soil is 
essentially impossible. So that's part of my decision making there too, is like, it, it really, I can only grow flowers in here or annuals because they can only grow as deep as I'm able to dig or as tall as the raised bed is. So <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, I totally get that. Um, so we're at about an hour. So mm -hmm. I want to um, kind of respect everybody's time and thank everybody for being here. Does anybody have any questions for Tab? I want to let you guys know that Tab is offering some coaching for other florists. We're going to share that information with you guys in our next Every STEM Community email. So if you're not on the email list, like I mentioned earlier, go ahead and pop your email address in the chat and I'll make sure you get that information. Um, we're going to share the recipes that um, are from the wedding that we talked about with her today. And, um, you know, going foam free is a really important decision. I think that if I still owned my own flower shop that I sold several years ago, I would probably have done that already. Um, but I've got to be honest, a lot of the florists that I freelance for still use foam and they use it because it is easier. Um, and I think it's important to think about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And if it's the answer is it's just easier we might want to rethink about how we're doing that so that we can make sure that we're leaders in our communities, that we're doing the right thing for our own health and our environment. Um, and so I encourage you guys to try to use alternative methods as much as possible. I understand, like Tab said, it's not always a one, a, a one or a zero, right? It's a process. You know, if there's something where you're like, okay, there's these centerpieces, I really think I could make this with foam a lot faster, but I'm going to take the time to put a frog in the bottom, put some chicken wire in there and make it foam free. Um, you know, those little steps over time can really add up and every little bit counts. So just keep that in mind as you're running your business. And, um, you know, it's not wrong or bad. We don't want to shame anyone, but we do want everybody to know that there are alternatives and that being a foam-free florist can actually bring you closer to the clientele that you want to reach if that's what's true in your heart like it is for Tab. So I think that's a really nice thing. It's 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 part of her business. And as she said when she first started, you know, if I'm using reusable straws and I'm not using paper towels and I'm using, you know, reusable towels in my house, why would I then go and use a single use plastic in my business on a daily basis? So keep those things in mind. And, um, you know, if anybody has any questions for Tab, you can reach out to her on Instagram. She's at Atlanta Flower Company. And um, you can reach out to her on her website as well. I'll be sure to share all the information um, after the call and we'll do a replay. Um, Tab, thank you so much for being here. If there's one last little thing that you want to share with everybody, um, what would that be? I think the last thing that I would share with everybody, just as a last push of encouragement to move away from floral foam, is that you will find you can use less flowers doing designs without floral foam because you are not having to prioritize covering up a big block of green inside of your containers. So that would be my final push uh, to encourage you guys is that you can actually save a bit of money, cut back on your recipes a little bit, because you don't have to worry about this tight, full coverage. Um, you can kind of, if you're working with chicken wire, all you've got to do is just cover up that tiny little bit of chicken wire that's showing through with some greenery or something. You don't have to pack it full of flowers because you're using something that doesn't have that unnatural green color, you're able to cut back on your recipes a little bit. So you may even find that even though it's an initial investment for some new tools, you'll save some money down the line as well. I think that's such a great point. You know, a lot of us want to create more open, whimsical, organic and airy designs. And a lot of times when we use foam, I've noticed, you know, in my own experience that you feel like you end up having to put greenery or put flowers in places that you don't really want to put them because you're totally. covering the mechanics. So that's such a great Absolutely. point. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for being here today. I really appreciate it. I hope everybody has a great rest of the month and we'll see you at the next one. Thanks, Tab. Thanks guys. Bye.